Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people being always around, expecting that you speak to them and teach them and reveal deep things in your word to everyone. We pray, Lord, our expectation will not be disappointed tonight in Jesus' name that your word will enter into every heart, penetrate into everyone, and turn everything that needs to be turned around in every life in Jesus' name. Grant us, Lord, the illumination, inspiration of the Spirit, so that everything you have for us will receive in Jesus' name the heart to learn, the heart to obey, your grant to every one of us. We pray, Lord, a familiarity with your word will not make us lose the great things or revealing to every one of us in Jesus' name. Lord, make us go higher and go deeper and go further in the knowledge of the word of God in Jesus' name. And reach every life with a deeper experience for the Spirit of God tonight in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church shout, Amen. God bless you. you can be seated. We're coming to Mark chapter 10. As we look at Mark chapter 10 today, we're looking at verse 32, all through to verse 45. Mark chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 32. In verse 32, it says, And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. They were surprised. And as they followed, they were afraid. You might wonder, what kind of fear was that? They were going to Jerusalem, and the Lord had told them before, the things that will happen in Jerusalem, they were apprehensive. They were afraid. Is this the time when that thing will happen? And yet they didn't understand fully everything they were thinking about. And in the middle of that verse 32, it says, And it took them again, the twelve, and began to tell them what things should happen unto them. And then you come to verse 35, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came, they come unto him, saying, Master, we would that you sh thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do unto you for you? And then it goes on. They told him what they wanted him to do. And eventually, it was something that they shouldn't have asked. And he told them, he couldn't give that to them. The ten heard about it. They were indignant. They were furious. They were angry. How could you ask something like that? Look at verse 41. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased. In other passages of the same story, it says you are full of indignation with James and John. And then the Lord set them right and told them they should look at his example and look at everything he said before them. And they shall follow after, verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. We're going to go through this passage by the grace of God. I want to see what the Lord wants us to learn. The topic tonight is the lingering ignorance of Christ's revelation. Christ had given them the revelation and they lingered in ignorance. 
they didn't want to know beyond what they were being told. Actually, the Lord had repeated this about his sacrifice many, many times when he first revealed it in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, reading from verse 21. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, it says, From that time, from that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. The first time Jesus revealed that to them. And he told them, this is what is going to happen. A preview of coming action of the children of Israel and of the, of the scribes and the Pharisees. And he told them, it will happen in Jerusalem. He will die for the sins of the world. And then on the third day, he will rise again. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, they shall not happen, shall not be unto thee. Verse 23, But he turned, and he said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not, you don't relish, you don't accept, you don't embrace, you don't understand the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Since that time, that they had an idea that Jesus was going to die in Jerusalem. They didn't think of the purpose. They didn't think of the reason. They didn't think of why Jesus came into this world. They wanted to be ignorant of that. They said, that is something you don't want to hear. That is something you don't want to know. And that ignorance lingered with them. There are many people like that. They hear something for the first time and they say, how can that be? They hear something the second time. They say, are we still going to have that? And they hear for the third time and it's like, how will that be? They just do not want to know. Look at Mark chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 30. Mark chapter 9, we're looking at verse 30. And you will see the attitude of deliberately wanting to remain in ignorance concerning such an important subject. Mark chapter 9, verse 30. And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man know it. And he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that is killed, he will rise the third day. Look at verse 32 now. But they understood not the same. And they were afraid to ask him. They understood not the sin. And they were afraid to ask him. In other matters, when he taught and he didn't understand, they would ask him. They would say, Master, how are you about that? Why did you say that? How could you say that? What's the meaning of that? But in this case now, they just didn't want to know. They were afraid to ask him. They wouldn't ask. Is there any subject of the Bible? Is there any teaching in the Bible? Is there any doctrine of the Bible that you do not want to hear about? You don't, do not know to learn. And when you have such a subject, it's like, well, are we thinking of that again? Is that still in the Bible? You want to be willingly ignorant of such a thing. Look at Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 44. Luke chapter 9, verse 44. Let these saints sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. The Lord said, I'm going to say something important now. 
I'm going to say something very essential now. And let this sin sink down. Down deep in your heart. Down deep in your ears. Down deep in your consciousness. Because the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. What was their attitude? Let it sink into your heart. Did they meditate on it? Did they accept that? Look at verse 45. But they understood not the same. And it was hid from them. And they perceived it not. And they feared to ask him of that same. Other subjects they will ask. Somebody was not healed when they prayed. They will ask, why wasn't that person healed? What could we have done that we didn't do? And we would explain to them. He spoke about marriage. They didn't understand an aspect. When they got to the house, they asked him, but how he about this? And he explained unto them. He told them it is not what enters into your mouth that defiles you, but what goes out of your mouth. They didn't understand, but they asked him. In this case, particular case, he was speaking about his death about his sacrifice, about his going to the cross and dying for the sins of the whole of humanity. Did he fully understand? But he didn't want to understand. Did he want to know? Even when he said, let this say sink down deep into your ears, yet they will not ask. Look at John chapter 16. In John chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 6. John Chapter 16, verse 6. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. I said these things unto you. It is going to happen. And this is why I came to this world. That you are being in fellowship with me, in affection with me, in love with me. And you like me to be here. That will not take over what the Lord wants done. And sorrow filled their heart. Look at verse 16 there. In verse 16, it tells us, in verse 16, a little while, and ye shall see, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this? That he says unto us, a little while and ye shall see, not see me. And again, a little while ye shall see me. And because I go to the Father, he was talking about his death. And he had told him over and over, I will die for the sins of humanity. And then I'll be buried. On the third day I will rise again. And you will see me again. And then after that I'll go to the Father. That's exactly what was telling them now. A little while that crucifixion will happen and you will not see me. A little while after three days I'll rise from the dead and you will see me. And they said, what does this mean? We don't understand. And yet they will not ask him. Look at verse 18. They said, therefore, what is this? That he says, a little while, we cannot tell what he says. Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that? I said, a little while, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me. The point is very clear. They were ignorant of this particular thing. And they were not willing to ask. They were not willing to know. And they were deliberately ignorant. Actually, what happened to those Jews, the disciples, happened to the whole of Israel. That there were things they were holding on to. And they knew that Christ had come. They knew that the Messiah had come. And they remained ignorant of what they ought to know about the value of his sacrifice. And about the provision of his salvation. They refused to know. They did want to hear that all the works of their hand, they are valueless, they are worthless, and it concerns salvation. But the sacrifice of Christ, the atonement of Christ, the righteousness that comes from Christ, that is the thing they ought to understand, they ought to believe, they ought to embrace so they can have salvation. They were 
willingly ignorant and the ignorance lingered with them let's look at romans chapter 10 in romans chapter 10 i'm reading from verse uh, 3 romans chapter 10 verse 3 for they being ignorant of god's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of god they could have had that righteousness of god that salvation from god that redemption from christ and the benefit of what he did for them on the cross of calvary but no they wouldn't want that and they remained in ignorance i pray you'll not remain in ignorance i said you'll not remain in ignorance the important thing about salvation the important thing about his death, the important thing about the sacrifice of Jesus, the important thing about the atonement of Jesus. There are many people that say, no, I don't want to hear that. I'm already in a denomination. I'm already in a religion. And my religion suits me. When, I, when my good works are greater than my bad works, I know I will get to heaven. And we say, no, it is not like that that your works cannot get you to heaven no matter how good they are you must understand that jesus came that he might save us from all our iniquities uh -uh. i don't want to hear that one one thing i know i'm in religion and my religion is enough look at second uh, corinthians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 11 second corinthians chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 11. It says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. When you are ignorant of the devices of Satan, that he wants to keep you in ignorance concerning redemption, concerning forgiveness, concerning salvation, concerning God's righteousness. He wants to keep you in ignorance and um, you accept that you remain in ignorance. I've got enough. I've known enough. I've had enough. I've studied enough. I've received enough. And I don't want any other sin. Then you fall into the devices of Satan. I pray it will not happen to you like that. I said it will not happen to you like that. Let's look at uh, Second Peter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 5. Second Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 5. The first part of verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of. For this they willingly are ignorant of. There are people willingly. They remain in ignorance. They know that the truth is being preached in a particular place. They know that full redemption is being declared in a particular place. They know that if I go to that place, I will hear the undiluted word of God that will bring me salvation, that will bring me conversion, that will bring me eternal life. They know they do not have the victory over sin and the victory over self with all the salvation they profess and with all the religion they profess they do not have what it takes to get to heaven but they keep on just uh, moving on and going on from day to day into ritual into ceremony into this and that they're willingly ignorant of the thing that will get them to heaven i pray that that willing ignorance deliberate ignorance will not happen to any of us in jesus name look at disciples of jesus christ they were hearing the truth fresh from the very Son of God. They were hearing the truth in a way they could never hear the truth any other place. In fact, the people that were sent to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ said, Never man speak like this man, even though the outsiders knew. Even though the officers knew, even though many of the Jews knew that no man ever spoke like this man. And the disciples knew that this is the very personified word of God. And yet, there were things they were ignorant of, and they remained in their ignorance. I will not remain in ignorance. I said, I will not remain in ignorance. We're talking about, we're teaching tonight on the lingering ignorance of Christ's revelation. The lingering ignorance. The ignorance that lingers. It was there. It is still there, 
and it's still going to be there for some days for them until reality will burst out to them and they will know this is the reality. I pray that ignorance will not remain in our hearts. Ignorance will not linger in our lives. Ignorance will not linger in our thinking and approach to the word of God in Jesus' name. Any amen from the church? The lingering ignorance of Christ's revelation. Three things we're looking at as we consider the passage. Number one, the revelation of Christ's unspotted sacrifice. The revelation, it was revealing to them. He was telling them about what will happen to him, about the sacrifice, about the atonement, about the necessity of his death for the redemption of the whole world. Number one, the revelation of Christ's unspotted sacrifice. Number two, the reflection of their carnal on sanctified self-centeredness. In the midst of it all, as the Lord revealed unto them, he was going to die. They didn't even think of the pain, of the agony, of the suffering, of the trauma. The Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and their Master, the Messiah, the Christ, the Redeemer, they didn't think of the agony and the suffering he will go through. All they want is, put me on this side, put me on that side. Their carnal, unsanctified, self-centeredness. The reflection point number two, the reflection of their carnal, unsanctified, self-centeredness. Point number three, our realization of, Christ, of Christ-like, unselfish servanthood. After he instructed them, and now he gave them the understanding they ought to have. And the example he has come to lay. He came to tell them that this is the way I've lived. And the reason I lived in that way is so as to show you an example. And to show you a pattern. And to show you the way you ought to go. He wanted them to realize and he wants us to realize that Christ-like on selfish servanthood that he demonstrated and that he wants us to demonstrate. I pray will not miss that demonstration. I pray will not miss the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ and everything that he has demonstrated to us so that we too can have that same heart, we can have that same mind, we can have that same disposition of unselfish servitude in Jesus' name. Amen. We're coming back to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 32. This point number one now, the revelation of Christ's unspotted sacrifice. The revelation he gave them. Mark chapter 10. We're looking at verse 32. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus went before them. And they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve and began to, to tell them what things would happen unto him, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. But that's not the end of the story. He told them he will suffer, he will suffer insult, he will suffer abuse, he will suffer a lot of persecution, they will spit on him, they will scourge him, they will mock him. But then he said, after that day, the third day he shall rise again. The third day he shall rise again. He didn't only speak about his death or about his burial. He spoke about his death and his burial and the third day resurrection that he will rise again uh, let's look at it now the revelation of christ on spotted sacrifice we're looking at mark chapter 8 and verse 31 mark 
chapter 8, and we're reading from verse 31. In verse 31, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. Underline the word must there, must. This compulsory must, this is something he could not escape. In fact, this is the very reason he came to the world. He must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. But every time he spoke about his death, his atoning death, is substitutionary death is death that will bring us from death unto life he always ended up by talking about his, his resurrection because it's in that resurrection we have redemption and it says and after three days shall rise again after three days shall rise again we're coming to luke chapter 9 verse 22 luke chapter 9 and we're reading from verse 22. In Luke chapter 9, verse 22, here are the words of Jesus again. You know what he did? He repeated it over and over. You and I, preachers, you and I, ministers, if you, thought something, if you said something the first time, and the closest people to you, and the disciples, and the members of the church, and even the people you have sent out to preach, and they have preached, and they want you to, you, you know, keep on with them. If they reject what you have said, you and I have the tendency of saying, okay, they don't want to hear. Okay, they don't want to know. Therefore, we'll not talk about that anymore. You have to. If that's the only way to heaven, you have to. If that's the only way for salvation, you have to. If there is no other way, if there's no other doctrine, if there is no other cleansing value in any other sea, but this is the way, you have to. You cannot say, I told them before, I didn't hear, didn't listen, so I'm not going to say that again. You keep on like Jesus Christ. That tenacity of purpose and that consistency of teaching may the Lord give unto us in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 22, saying, The Son of Man must suffer. Look at that word again there, must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be slain. Look at this again, and be raised. The third day, he kept on revealing it. I pray that that same consistency, the Lord will give to you. And that same commitment, the Lord will give to you. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's look at uh, Luke chapter 24. I'm reading from verse 25. Luke chapter 24. And we're reading from verse uh, 25. He knew their condition, he knew their mind, he knew their state of mind. And this is what is said in uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 20, verse 25. And he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He said, I told you I was going to die. I told you on the third day I will rise again. But you were slow of heart to believe. Not only to believe what I said, but what the prophets have said. Look at verse 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to have entered into his glory? Don't you know? This had been predicted and this had been prophesied and this had been revealed long before I came. And then it says in verse 27, I'm beginning at Moses. And all the prophets expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, and he said unto them, These are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled. Look at that. All things must be fulfilled. All things about his suffering. 
all things about all the speeching on him, all things about the scorching, all things about the crucifixion, all things about everything he will go through until he'll be killed and slain as a substitute for the sins of the whole world. All things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, thus it is written, that it was written that Christ will come. It was written that the Messiah will come. It was written that the Son of God, the Son of God, will come. And then he will suffer for the sin of humanity. He said, Thus it is written. And thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins shall be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Do you see that before his death, he said it. After his death, he said it. When he rose from the dead, he emphasized it. Although the disciples were slow apart to believe, he told them it had been written. Where was that written? In the Old Testament? In many parts of the Old Testament. We're looking at Psalm 22. Psalm 22, we're reading from verse 1. It's what we see concerning him. All these were prophesied concerning the Lord Jesus Christ before he came to this world. And he knew all those things must be fulfilled. But the disciples at that time, they were turning their mind away from that, turning their eyes away from that, turning their understanding away from that. But look at it in verse 1, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? He was roaring, he was talking to the Lord. That's, those are the words he spoke on the cross of Calvary. All those things have been written before. And Jesus knew that everything, all things written concerning him must be fulfilled, will be fulfilled, although the disciples were slow in uh, getting out of their darkness and getting out of their ignorance. Look at verse 7. All they that see me love me to scorn. They shoot out the leaves, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that He would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing He delighted in him. That's what He said when He was on the cross of Calvary, dying for us, paying the penalty, and paying our ransom. For us to be born again, for us to be saved, and for us to pass from death unto life eternal. Look at verse 16. For dogs have compassed, have compassed me. The assembly of, of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. The Lord Jesus knew that. He knew that would happen. And so he was going to the cross, he was going to Jerusalem, and he knew that this is what will happen. They pierce my hand, they pierce my feet. That's what he was trying to tell the disciples, teach the disciples, reveal to the disciples, but he was slow to understand. Look at verse 18 there, verse 18, they patch my garments among them, and cast lords upon my vesture. And yet he knew that was going to rise from the dead. That death will not be the final story. That death will not be the final end of the way. Resurrection was going to come. And he will still be Lord. Look at verse 28. For the kingdom is the Lord's. And he is the governor among the nations. He knew he will rise again. And he knew that when he rose again, he was going to rule over the whole world, over the whole universe. Let's come to Isaiah now. Isaiah, I'm reading from chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. 
and we're reading from verse 6, Isaiah chapter 50, and we're looking at verse 6 here. It says in verse 6, I give my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the air. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. That's the suffering he was to go through, and he knew it. And he revealed to his own disciples, if they were reading their Old Testament, they would have known that this is what will happen to the Messiah. This is what will happen to Christ when he came. Look at chapter 53 of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53, and we're reading from verse 3. Isaiah chapter 3, 53, verse 3, he is despised. Are rejected of men. That's what he said. That the chief priests and those uh, rulers and those religious leaders will reject him. He is despised and rejected of man. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we, we esteemed him. No, surely he has borne our griefs. Surely he has carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for a transgression. He had to do that. He must do that. So that we can be free from those transgressions. He was wounded for our transgressions. And he was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Look at verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. The sacrifice image, the atonement image, and the death he died was for all people. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone, every man, every woman, every creature, everyone on earth. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The iniquity of us all. That's the reason he had to die. That's the reason he had to go to Calvary. That's the reason he had to make his life an offering for the sins of the world. Eventually, those disciples saw that those things had happened. And because they now saw, looking back at the cross, looking back at the shame, looking back at the suffering, looking back at the crucifixion, looking back at the resurrection now, Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Now they understood, and this is very important, and I pray you will understand. I said, I pray you will understand. Acts chapter 2, we're looking at verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. You see that? Now as they look back to Calvary, as they look back to the cross, what they didn't understand before, what they were ignorant of before, they said, now we understand that he was delivered by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up. Christ was now in heaven. He has ascended to heaven. And the disciples were now talking about his death and they too, they will not terminate their discussion, their revelation on death. They're going to talk about his resurrection. Verse 24, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pace of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Not possible that he should be holding of it, because that resurrection was to bring our redemption. That resurrection was to bring our salvation. He died and then he rose again. I pray the benefit of that resurrection will be real in your life in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 13, we're reading from verse 28. Acts chapter 13, we're looking at verse 28. And though the found no cause of death in him, yet desired the pilot that he should be slain. Look at verse 29. And when he had, they had fulfilled all that was written of him, 
those people they didn't, see, they didn't know they were fulfilling prophecy when they arrested him when he was betrayed when they nailed him to the cross when they heard him cry my god my god why have you forsaken me when they gave him gall to drink and when they throw the spear at his side when they pierced him, they didn't know they were fulfilling what had been written. When they took him down from the cross, and when they buried him, and when on the third day he rose from the dead, and they told the soldiers, go and tell them lies, and go and say that his disciple came to take him away. They didn't know they were fulfilling the scriptures. But now, the apostle Paul, looking back at what had happened, the Apostle Paul looking back at the revelation that Christ had given before he was even born again himself. He now said when they had fulfilled all that was reaching of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulchre. But God raised him from the dead. Praise the Lord. But God raised him from the dead. I said praise the Lord. But God raised him from the dead. Every time they didn't stop at the negative, they didn't end or the negative. They said, Yes, he died, yes, he was slain, and yet he made his life an atonement for our sins. But God raised him from the dead, and he was seen many days of them which came up were seen from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you the glad tidings, the good news, the gospel, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God had fulfilled the same unto us, the children, in that he has raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou shalt thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that, he raised him from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, that is to the grave. He said, on this wise I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, he also says in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep and was laid unto the fathers and saw corruption. In verse 37, but he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Here is the conclusion. Here is the reason. Here is the revelation. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Through that Christ who died for us, through that Christ who made the atonement, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. You understand? Without his death, no forgiveness. Without his death, no redemption. Without his death, no salvation. Without his death, no righteousness that will make you pure enough, righteous enough, holy enough to get to heaven. Because it is through him, it is through what he has done that that righteousness comes to us, comes unto us. But Saturday night, and by him, all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now, we have read about the revelation concerning Christ's sacrifice and concerning what he did on the cross of Calvary. And we'll be referring to the Old Testament. We'll be referring to the Psalms and into Isaiah and many other passages of Scripture we could refer to. But let me show you something. Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 6. Revelation chapter 5. We're looking at verse 6. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as if as it had been slain, having seven hands, total power, 
and seven eyes total knowledge which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth verse 7 and he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne that's the ancient of days that's the almighty God as a father and when he had taken the book the four beasts living creatures and the four and twenty elders representing all the redeemed in the whole universe fell down and before before the lamb having every one of them halves and golden pearls full of odors which are the prayers of the saints. Look at verse 9. And he sung in your song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain. Thou wast slain. Is the death that qualified him, is the sacrifice that qualified him to give us salvation, to be a savior. To be a redeemer because thou was slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the bees and the elders and the number of them was ten thousand and ten thousand and thousands of thousands look at verse 12 saying with a loud voice worthy is the lamb that was slain worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them had I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that seated on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever and the people of God said that he may look small Amen in Jesus' name. Look at Revelation chapter 13. You need to understand this. Underline it to your Bible. Chapter 13 of Revelation. And I'm reading from verse 8. Chapter 13, reading from verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of, the, of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Christ predicted, prophesied, he will die for the sins of the world, not only from the books of Moses and the Psalms and the prophets, even from the foundation of the world, that had been declared and when Jesus declared to the disciples they should have understood whether they accepted or not it was going to happen whether they asked any question about it or not it was going to happen whether they believed it or not it was going to happen Jesus died on the cross of Calvary and I will praise the name of the Lord that he died for you, that he died for me, that he died for every one of us and whosoever will believe in the death of Christ and the burial of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, whosoever will believe, salvation will be yours in Jesus' name. Redemption will be yours in Jesus' name. Now we come to point number two is the reflection of their canal on sanctified self centeredness. We're coming to Mark chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 35. Mark chapter 10, verse 35. Before I read this part of the study tonight, let me ask you is somebody close to you? Is somebody dear to you? Is somebody precious to you? Is somebody who has been so loving? Is somebody who has provided for you all the time since you knew him? Is giving you water? 
He's giving you bread and he's giving you everything that you need. He's quenching the storm in your life and he has uh, given you some honor. If he just told you and he said, can I tell you something? In a few weeks, I will die. And it's not a kind of pleasant death. It's not a kind of death that you say, okay, he died in sleep. He just went away peacefully. It's going to be a violent death. It's going to be terrible. And then after he has told you all the agony and all the suffering and everything he would go through. And remember, this is the person who has been your benefactor, your provider. And then immediately after that now, you say, now, when you establish this, your company you've been telling me about, can I be your executive? Can I be the leader there? Can I be the controller of everything? I just told you about the violent death that is coming. And then you are telling me now, what you are looking for is position, obviously. That's carnality. Obviously, that's being unsanctified. Obviously, that's being insensitive. That's what we're reading about now in Mark chapter 10, reading from verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? He said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit one on the right hand and the other on the left hand in thy glory. Uh -huh. What he wanted was glory. He talked about pain that didn't concern them. He talked about agony that didn't concern them. He talked about dying, that didn't concern them. He talked about his betrayal, that didn't concern them. That will be on the right and on the left in thy glory. But Jesus says unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of? What I've been telling you, that will happen to me, that I'll be taken by wicked hands. And I'll be crucified. I'll be slain. I'll be put to death. Can you endure that? Oh, they said, I'll be baptized in the baptism with the baptism that I'm baptized with. And they said unto him, We can. We can. We want that position so much. We can. We want that elevation so much. We can. We want that recognition so much. We want to share in the glory. We want to be on this side and on this side in your glory when you come to reign. And whatever price we're going to pay for that, we can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and be baptized with that baptism, with the baptism that I'm baptized with thou, shall ye be baptized but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not, from, is not mine to give you, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. Verse 41 and when the ten heard it they themselves began to be much displeased with James and John. That's another way of saying they were angry. They were unhappy. How could you do that? Well, following Jesus Christ, now James and John, you want to sit here and you want to sit over there? That's carnality. Have you read your Bible? Look at J Jeremiah chapter 45. Jeremiah chapter 45. This is what we should understand. And this is what they should have read. But probably they have not read this. And if they have read this, they have not taken it to heart. It says in Jeremiah chapter 45, verse 5, Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. Here is the question the Lord is asking. Now you are in the kingdom. Now you are following the Lord. Now you are a believer. Why are you a believer? Why are you in the kingdom? 
And why are you so dutiful doing everything you're doing? He said, because I want to be like James and John. I want to sit one on this side and one on the other side. Anything I ask him, I want him to give me. I want to be above all the other disciples. Verse 5, seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. That's what the Lord is telling us. You're in the kingdom. Salvation, that's great enough. Sanctification, that's great enough. The power of the Holy Ghost upon your life, that's great enough. A place in heaven, a place in heaven, a mansion in heaven, that's great enough. And that he himself in the kingdom will sit down and will feed you, that's great enough. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. Remove that from your mind. Go back to Calvary and let him pour you, purify you, and take away from you that uh, idea and that passion and that uh, kind of desire of being higher than everybody else. In James chapter 4, James chapter 4, we're looking at verse 3. James chapter 4, verse 3, ye ask and receive not. Because he asked a miss, James and John, you asked, you asked a miss. And the Lord will not give you that because he asked a miss, that she may consume it upon your lust. That she may consume it upon your lust. The Lord counts that as carnality. And we shouldn't be carnal. We shouldn't seek position. While well, we're talking about the agony of Christ, and we're talking about sinners perishing, and we're talking about those who are going to hell, and we're talking about those who are suffering, and the Lord wants you to forget anything you desire, anything you want, and He wants you to think of the people who are perishing. Look at Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, we're reading from verse 5. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh and do mind the things of the flesh cannot please God. He said, let me read that again. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Look at verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. To be carnal, I want this above others. And that's your dream, that's your desire, that's your pursuit, that's your possession, that's your passion. For to be carnally minded is death. And but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. What kind of disciple are you, John? What kind of disciple are you, James? That Christ had just spoken about his death and his agony and his suffering and that he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be slain. And the next thing that comes to your mind is when you come to your glory. What are you going to give us? Can you answer our request and put us there and put us there? James, John, brother, sister, anyone there? Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh, and they want to seek after this and seek after that, and they want to turn the kingdom of God to a political campaign, and they want to tell this and tell that, you know, what do you think of? If I will be on the left hand side or on the right hand side, what do you think of? If a family will be the next one on this side and on that side, when we're talking about the sinners who are perishing, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. I pray our lives will please God. My life will please God. I said my life will please God. You would have thought that after James and John, after the correction, after the cleansing, 
after everything the Lord had said, you would have thought that nobody else would think like that. But look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 21. Philippians chapter 2. We're reading from verse 21. For all seek their own. For all seek their own. Their own advantage. Their own progress. Their own possession. And their own gain. What can I gain out of that? Well, I've come. I'm a member of the church. I've come. I'm a minister in the church. I've come. I'm a worker in the church. I've come. Um, you know, a conspicuous person in the church. But I'm not just here for nothing. I came for you. Receiving what will I get? That's what the word of God is saying for all seek their own. And not the things which are Jesus Christ. That's actually why Jesus began to pray for them. They were saved, they were children of God, but this kind of thing in their heart, I want to sit there, I want to sit there, I want to be known, I want to be recognized, and they were seeking their own. That's why you have John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, reading from verse 17, John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth, that what is truth? If there was no carnality in the heart, he will not pray that prayer for them. If there was no depravity in the heart, he will not pray this prayer for them. If there was no self-centeredness in them, he will not pray this prayer for them. Do you claim to be sanctified? The testimony is not enough. It's their carnality in you. You need sanctification now. Is their place seeking in you? You need sanctification then. Is there the desire to be above every other person and to be calling the shores and to sit on the throne? Other people go here, go there. You need sanctification. Sanctify them through thy truth. That through thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone. Neither pray I for James and John alone. Neither pray I for the indignant disciples alone. Neither pray I for the twelve alone. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou Father art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Sanctification does a work of grace in the heart that the world will see. The pride is gone. Place seeking is gone. And seeking something great for ourselves, all that is gone. All we want to live for now is the glory of God alone. May God do it in you and in me, in all of us, in Jesus' name. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 25. Us must love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. What did he give himself for the church? That he might sanctify and cleanse it or the washing of water by the word. He speaks the word to us and the word acts like water and cleanses us and purges us and purifies us. That's his will. And that is what he wants to take place in every heart. In verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church when all the place seeking is gone from everybody, that will be a glorious church. When all the personal desires, and we bury that and submit that under the blood of Christ, under the glory of Christ, and we want Christ alone to be glorified, that will give us a glorious church. When the Adamic nature is taken away, when the depravity is taken away, and it purges us, and it, cleans, and it, and it perfects us within, that is when there will be a glorious church that he might present it unto himself, a glorious church, not having 
spot or wrinkle or any such thing, you know, but that it should be holy and without blemish. He will do it. I said he will do it. Amen. And look at First Thessalonians chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. That's the will of God. That's the desire of God. That's the plan of God. That's the provision of God. He wants that Adamic nature totally taken away from our hearts. He wants the place-seeking spirit to be taken away totally from us. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Hebrews chapter 13, we're reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 12. It says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. You see that he suffered for salvation. But he knows that after, after salvation, there's still the carnality there. There's still the depravity there. There's still the Adamic nature there. There is still the propensity and the tendency to want days and want days. There's still the tendency not to think of his glory alone, but to think of your own glory. That's why he suffered for the church, Jesus also. That he might sanctify the people with his own blood. He suffered without the gate. Let us Go, let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. I pray that experience will belong to all of us. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15, we're reading from verse 9. He did it for the disciples. He'll do it for us. I said he'll do it for us. Look at now, chapter 15, Acts chapter 15, verse 9. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. We need to consecrate ourselves to the Lord and lay everything on the altar and say, Lord, I didn't, I didn't come into the kingdom to seek anything for myself or to attract anything to myself or to drive anything for myself. All I want is your glory. And whatever it is in me that is still carnal, whatever it is in me that is still selfish, whatever it is in me that is still self-centered, oh Lord, put everything away. And then you believe, after laying everything on the altar, and you put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. By faith, they will do it. I said by faith, they will do it. We're coming back to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. We're reading from verse 42 now. The Lord is going to show us his example. He's going to show us his pattern. He's going to show us the way to go. He's going to show us what Christ likeness is all about. Our realization of Christ like unselfish servanthood. Mark chapter 10, verse 42. But Jesus called them to him and says unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to, be, to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. He said, you've looked at the world, you've been in the world, even though you are no more of the world, you've seen how the people of authority, how the people in rulership, how the people who have dominion, how the other people around, how the center, every attention upon themselves. And they want to show that they are men and women of authority. They are men and women of power. And the Lord thinks over people. Verse 43, but so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. 
and whosoever of you will be chiefest or be greatest or be highest shall be the servant of all. Here is an example now, the Messiah. Is example the master, is example the Lord, is example our Redeemer, is example the one who gave up everything that you might have salvation. Here is the pattern, the example. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. What's he saying? He's saying, do not be conformed to this world. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is not just that I don't, I don't wear this, I don't wear that, I don't pinch the leaves, I don't have eyelashes. That's not what we're talking about now. When you act like the world, when you act like a politician, when you act like a ruler in the world, when you act as if every the world should be under your feet, is saying that does not show that you know the example of Christ, and that does not show and reveal the sanctification. It says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, exercising power, exercising authority, ruling or force over people, driving them here and there, calling the shores and being on top of everyone. He said, that's of the world. And he says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I pray we'll be like that. To be like that is to be like Jesus. To be like that is to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. To be like that is to show that he has cleansed us, he has purged us, he has purified us, he has taken away that thing that makes people to behave like the rulers and the leaders of the world. In Matthew chapter 20 verse 26, Matthew chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 26. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He's telling us, he told us in Mark, he's told us in Matthew. Let's see what he says in Luke. We're looking at Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. He's repeated it over and over so that by the grace of God, I will get it. By the grace of God, you will get it. The Adamic nature will not take priority over our lives in Jesus' name. Depravity will not take the better part of our lives in Jesus' name. Carnality will not be so entrenched in our lives that all the time, whatever Christ has said, whatever we have read, and whatever we are taught, having that mind, seeking great things for ourselves and not for the Lord. We're looking at Luke chapter 22, and I'm reading from verse 26. In verse 26, but ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that does serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is, he, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I, Christ, but I, your Redeemer, but I, your Master, but I, your perfect example, but I am among you as he that serves. That's the concept he wants us to have. That's the mind he wants us to have. We'll have it in Jesus' name. Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 3. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife of inglory. 
let nothing be done through power demonstration, through dominion, through exercising authority. Let nothing be done through depraved nature. Let nothing be done through depravity. Let nothing be done through strife of vain glory, self-glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things. What I have, who I am, my big position, my great position. Don't you know me? I called you to come and you didn't run. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I stand for? Don't you know my title? Don't you know what I am here? Look not every man on his own things, but every man also of the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let the mind of Christ, the mind of humility, and the mind of serving, serving other people, let that mind be in you. Don't always be saying, it's not obeying me, I show him. She's not obeying me, I'll show her. She's not running after my commandment, I'll show him. And she's not bending and trembling before me. And she's something as if, okay, we're equal. You're a believer, I'm a believer. You're a child of God, I'm a child of God. I'll show him, I'll show him what authority I have. Uh-uh, don't do that. That's carnality. That's depravity. That's the Adamic nature. It says, let this might be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of his servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I pray we'll not miss that example in Jesus' name. In First Corinthians chapter 10, First Corinthians chapter 10, we're reading from verse 24. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 24. It says in verse 24, let no man seek his own. His own advantage, his own promotion, his own exaltation, his own power, his own authority. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Every man another's wealth, another's joy, another's happiness. First Corinthians chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 19. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. For do I be free from all men? I have made myself servant unto all. Paul got the message. Paul had the experience. Was Paul saw the example and the pattern of Jesus Christ. And he went to the cross, he went to Calvary, and he consecrated himself, and he believed on the Lord, and the Lord crushed out that self-centered life. He says, though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I may gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. He's saying, I'm not always standing for my right. I know I'm redeemed. I know I'm a child of God. I'm not under the law. I don't have to do that. I don't have to bend law. I don't have to serve, whether Jew or Gentile. I know that's my right, but I'm not standing on my right. You know people who say they are born again, 
but they are not sanctified all the time. This is my right. Nobody will take my right away from me. In the home, that's why the home is not settled. In their place of work, that's why the place of work is not prospering. And in the local church, that's why they are not making progress. They always want to stand on their right until they realize this is my right until they give me what i'm worth and they understand that this is where i am i'm not going to allow peace in the community uh -uh. paul the apostle said i made myself a servant of all the lord gave us understanding and the lord grant us the experience in jesus name verse 21 to them that are without law as without law, not being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, I, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak. To the weak became I as weak. You know, there are people who always want to want to demonstrate their strength. I'm strong. I can see anything. I can push anyone. I can call any shot. I can say anything before anybody. I'm strong. And I don't fear anyone. But Paul the Apostle said, I'm as strong as you are. I'm as mighty as you are. But you know what? To the weak became I as weak. That I might gain the weak. It says, I don't have any interest of making the weak to be lost or pushing the weak away so that I always have my way. I don't care what happens to people. If they want to go to hell, they're weak, let them go to hell. If they want to perish, let them perish. But this is me. I'm going to demonstrate my strength. Paul the Apostle said, No. You have not been to Calvary for that second transformation and second touch. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I, made, I am made all things to all men. I am made all things to all men. And I'm willing to deny myself that I might by all means save some. You'll be an instrument of salvation. I said you'll be an instrument of salvation. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's read verse 5 and I'll back up to verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're looking at verse 5. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Believer, seeketh not her own child of God seeketh not our own. It's not self-conscious all the time. And he's saying, I hope they recognize who I am. I hope they recognize how to treat me. I hope they recognize I'm the greatest person here. Seeketh not her own. Now come back to verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I'm not charity, and I'm still seeking my own, and become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. But still, and though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and I'm not charity, and I'm still seeking my own, seeking my advantage, Seeking uh, to establish my position, seeking for people to understand this is who I am. I have authority over everybody. I have no charity. Seeking my own, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, and I have no charity because I'm still seeking my own, uh, my own advantage, I'm too conscious, self conscious every time. And I carry about the air of importance and popularity and exaltation. I have no charity. It profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long without exercising undue authority. And it's kind. Charity envies not without trying to copy the people who are political in their religion. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not popped up. Charity does not behave itself 
unseemly. If I don't show them who I am, they will think, uh, you know, I'm low down there. So I have to show them and behave unseemly. Charity doesn't do that. And charity seeketh not her own, and it's not easily provoked. Charity thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things. Doesn't bring his position there, his power there. I won't bear this. I won't take this. Because if you take this, then you'll do another thing. You have to know I am now. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. I pray that this experience of real sanctification and total freedom from depravity, from carnality, from self-seeking, from self-centeredness, from the spirit of James and John, I pray that this great experience the Lord will grant to everyone. I said the Lord will grant to everyone. We'll see the revelation of Christ on spot, spotted sacrifice, and he wants us to know through that blood that is shed, he wants us to know through that agony he went through, he wants us to know that through that death, we can have total redemption, salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism, and every blessing. And then we have reflected on the carnality of the unsanctified, self-centeredness of James and John. I pray there will be no repetition of that in any of our lives in Jesus' name. And the realization of Christ-like on selfish servitude, we will serve other people. I will serve everyone. You will serve everyone. Pride cancelled. Position seeking cancelled. Power demonstration cancelled. Exercising on due authority on other people cancelled. Your heart, your spirit, your mind, your life, your action will be like that of Christ in Jesus' name. Another amen. amen. A good amen. amen. A Bible-based amen. amen. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. This is what He wants to do in our lives. He wants to take that carnal spirit away that carnal attitude away. He wants to take away everything that looks like James and John wanting this and wanting that. He wants to give us the mind of Christ. Pray to the Lord. Consecrate yourself to the Lord and let him do it.